the most exciting part of a race. It's Iron Man and Paddy Merrick in the leader. It's about the second last or the last hurdle. Iron Man the leader. Fia Norman stands side. 50 yards from the line, wherever it is. It's Iron Man who has the lead from Fia Norman and Tony McCord. That instantaneous realisation of I'm going to fucking win here. The far side, Paddy the American, Tony McCoy on Fia Norman. Is the best feeling in the world. Iron Man is going to hold up and he's going to win just... You could take any drug in the world. You could visit the nicest place in the world. But paradise for me was, you know, riding that winner. <laughs> and that was it. You know, there was times where only the friends of mine reached out to me and they know who they are. That, you know, I could have been gone years ago. I remember lying in bed thinking, what? Well, if I had got a gun into my hand, it would have went into my hand. And it would have been as simple as I'd have put it to my head and I'd have, I'd have, I'd have blew my own head off. And, and that's how straightforward it would have been. I was in that much pain. I was in that much pain that it would have been that straightforward. It would have been just boom and bang. Just a snippet of the episode of Finn A that aired on TG Carter just this past Wednesday as part of their Wednesday documentary series, The Life and Times of One Paddy Merrigan. A life of several acts already and the man has just turned 33 and delighted to say that Paddy joins us in studio as well this evening. You're very welcome to, to Off the Ball Terrorist, Paddy, and, and taking time out from what has been a remarkable, I suppose, uh, weight-cutting exercise because we were just commenting before he came on air to look at you on camera like that was obviously filmed back in the earlier part of the year you've done some remarkable work even since then to be the trim and spell figure you are now yeah it's, uh, it's been a, a roller coaster journey for the last however long we started training the 1st of November and you know when we set out it was monumental and uh, to be honest I wasn't sure how I was going to do it but I knew I'd have to and, and pretty much we were over 16 stone and look after a year of grueling training, we got, you know, lost five and a half stone. That's remarkable stuff. All aided and abetted by your, your good friend, Anthony, who's been there for you along the way. That's correct, Anthony. Uh, it was, you know, it was impossible for me to do it on my own. So I called Anthony and, look, he was more than happy to help. And, yeah, we pushed hard for a long, a long time. And we had two sessions a day some days. And a friend of mine as well, uh, Martin Ward in the FINA, in the mixed martial arts gym, he had done a good few sessions with me as well around that as well so it was yeah a lot of work it seems like it's a different world and a different way of getting yourself ready for a race than perhaps you would have been used to when you started off i guess it was the only way there's no way i could have lost the weight any other way you know i had to do that training to lose enough weight before then i could start riding out in february we got back on the horses in february but riding horses wouldn't have been enough to lose the weight i had to add in the the, the training you know yeah do you still have the same feel for the horses because you mentioned in the documentary that it was that very first time when you got on in the you know the the riding yard in, in Athlone that as soon as you, st you got on the horse you knew like this is the thing for me do you still get the same buzz oh absolutely i love it more than ever now really and and uh, do you know what i appreciate it more than ever you know i've come back into the game now after a long time out, a decade over. You know, I know I'm still young, but it, it, it's been too long over. And, you know, I, I genuinely feel like I love it more than ever. And I, it's the best decision I ever did, that's, you know, no doubt. That's brilliant. But where have you been working recently? I work with Gordon Elliott and I school horses for Paul Flynn and David Broad. Yeah. And I love my job. L lots of people in work. You know, I was always a people's person. Uh, great staff and yeah, lots of good horses. Uh, it's slow enough for me with my career at the minute, but uh, I have a feeling if I keep doing what I'm doing, the boss tells me, you know, stay patient and keep showing up and uh, yeah, things will hopefully turn for me. Elliot's an infectious character. From our dealings with him, I think we've yeah. gotten a bit of a bit of that, but I guess you'd have a bit more insight to it than us. Yeah, no, look, Elliot, in fairness to Gordon, he's a good boss. Yeah. He's a fair boss. he give you an odd bollocking every now and again, but your luck. We're all used to that. I don't care how many bollockings I get as long as uh, <laughs> I enjoy my job every day and uh, hopefully get a chance at a couple of rides down the line. What are the bollockings down to these days? Uh, nothing, just anything. Anything that, look, it's a high-pressure yard and uh, he copes with it well. You know, for considering all the horses and big owners that are there, you know, that yard runs very smooth overall. He seems like a very placid character. Like, I know there's obviously going to be some turmoil and paddling underneath the water and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
but outwardly, considering the size of his operation, considering the amount of people that he, he deals with and is responsible for ultimately as well, he seems like a very cool customer. You couldn't run that yard unless you want. If every little thing got to you, it would drive you insane. Yeah. You know, he has a system that is in place and it works very well. Like, everyone has their moments, don't get me wrong, good and bad. But uh, the professionalism of that yard overall, to get out 270 horses or however many that is there every morning and, and bar, you know, a minimal of incident, bad incidents happen. And, uh, yeah, it's just a testament to all the staff and, and to the, the way it's ran from the top. What's your day like with them there from, from day to day? Is there a set kind of I structure just, to it or...? Just go in, ride horses, chat to everyone, have fun. Uh, it's a very serious job, but at the same time, I try and try to enjoy it. And yeah, it's just out. We ride, if the, maybe school a few horses or whatever, whatever is needed on that day. You know. It strikes me that from watching the documentary, from reading a bit of your backstory, from knowing the f- you're somebody who has when you have that click, when you have that affinity with a horse. Like it, it works from the off, and that seems like a rather useful tool to have around a yard for someone like Elliot, particularly with the the girth of the operation. Well, as in with with horses, I was just always very passionate with riding horses, and, and I obviously like you know when you form a click with a horse, any jockey knows, or any horse rider across any uh, equine industry knows. Uh, it's it's always good to, to form bonds with horses. I know it's hard in big operations. We ride so many different horses all the time. Yeah. But it's definitely, uh, yeah, help for the horse, definitely, as, as much as it's enjoyable for the rider, it's help for any horse. Did you feel that from the, from the very, very start when you, what, what age were you when you first? I think my first horse? race was probably 11 or 12. On ponies? Eight, uh, the flapping, yeah. Yeah, and like, was it something that was in your head as a youngster growing up? Or did you, like, oh, actually, I used to watch or? Richard Dunwoody and the boys riding, oh, Richard Dunwoody and the likes of them when I was young, and I remember watching Grand Nationals, and I, I'd always had an interest, and my sister had said to me, would, we like to, would I like to go horse riding? And uh, I'm not joking, the first day I set the horse, <laughs> it, you know, I was, it was like someone gave me a hard drug. I was addicted straight away. It's, like, it's a remarkable thing. Like, I'm somebody, I found this out at a much later date that apparently it's unusual to get to my station in life and I've never been on a horse, right? That's just where I am. But you got on board pretty young, pretty quick, and found out that was the thing for you. I knew instant. Yeah. That it was just, I loved it. I had a passion for it, not only that, I was, I was good at it instantly. I was jumping horses within a few days, and what had happened was I just became addicted to the place. So pretty much what had happened, I, I wouldn't go to school, I was ditching school and going riding horses, and, but I always felt like I was doing the right thing. Yeah, because you, you almost feel like it's a vocation from the off, and you can explain it way in your head and just keep going, but this is what I'm going to do. Why do I need to sit in the classroom and have be told, you know formulae for maths and all that kind of thing when all I need to do is know how to ride a horse probably. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what it is now but like when I was in school it was all old fashioned teachers that were just this is how you have to do it yeah. and and th- that's it and it just wasn't right for me you know now I do see maybe today I'm sure today school has changed a lot as well like the world in, totally. in general but yeah it's definitely something uh, it just wasn't for me school wasn't for me. What did your folks make of it when you're uh, my mum actually didn't know for months it's quite funny because she used to like think I was in school all the time but what I used to do was uh, I used to like just ditch school and, and go riding the horses but then the school had written to my mother and said where's your son been and my mother was like what the you know so she contacted me and said have you not been in school and I said no I haven't been in for months and so what she had to do then she used to drop me down to the front door of the school yeah. And once she dropped me and she'd watch me walk in, but all I do is walk straight by her, walk by all the teachers, and I'll go out and jump the back wall and I'd be gone. <laughs> and that was it. I remember that as clear as day. And I did that every day. I didn't mind. But you must have had people in the yard, I guess, who spotted your talent for that. Yeah, no, I. I and encouraged I, you to a degree. It, it was, well, not so much that. It was just so much. I, in my head, it was just, I want to write, I was, in a weird way, I was obsessed. As a young lad, I was obsessed. And, and not only that, it's, it's, I was happiest there. You know, I was always happiest riding horses all, all the time. That's an unusual thing for a, a, a developing mind to spot where they're happy and for it to be outside of the norm. Because like, kids just know school, home, school, home, and then do whatever, you know, on the evenings or the weekends. But to step outside of that at such a young age and to know that this is, the place where I'm happiest is is a massive thing for for young young minds to kind of take on board. Well, see, I was lucky in in the sense that I tried something 
that took over me, if you mm. know what I mean. Like where another kid might go and try something and, and it mightn't be. Like I found my love young. Horses is my love. Like I, like I said in the documentary, I love the horses I rode. I all, like it's, it's an insane passion that can't be described and, and, and I can't describe it. Well, it struck me when watching you as, as a younger rider, especially in, in the footage from, from Dingle, um, is that you had a remarkably old head on your shoulders. Like to see you being interviewed is to like watching a jockey of your age now. Like they give absolutely the same amount of stuff away, and they're Asher, you look annoyed. This is how it is, and I'm sure we'll see you tomorrow. How would it, how the, you know? It was that kind of stuff. From what age would you have been in that footage? Uh, in the footage in Dingle, uh, probably 16, I think. Scary. Yeah, but see, when you're around old heads, like when when you leave school. <laughs> You know, you're not around teachers, but you're around uh, older generations. And and for jockeys, when they ride horses for yeah. people, it's normally for older older people. So. Yeah. Tony Began was the was the man for you. Tony right? started me off in the flapping and uh, loved it with Tony's absolute character. Uh, school of hard knocks, I call it. You get in, you learn, or you get out. And and uh, whoever sticks it out will make it as a jockey. That's the way I look at it. There, it's like he has a right little uh, boot camp, if you want to call it that. Yeah. But it is, it's genuinely a place where uh, I believe if a young lad can go there, see it through, stick it out, get used to what it takes to work in a yard and do all the duties to, to end up riding good winners. Um, yeah, he's a unique way of doing things, but it works. It, it seemed works like the right place, right time for you as well. Perfect for me. I was a crazy little kid that needed a direction quick before I ended up down the wrong path, you know? So, yeah, yeah when, when you have that much enthusiasm for the game, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, you're going to do whatever it takes, you know. Yeah. You'll have your bad days, don't get me wrong. Nobody's perfect. But 99% of the time, you're going to show up and do the right thing. Yeah, and that, I guess, set you up and set you on the right trail and had you imbued with enough confidence that, you know, in the cusp of 18, really, you're heading off to the UK and you're looking to pitch your wits against the best in the game. And you had that in your head that you were... They're thereabouts of them already. Uh, in my mind, like like I said, I've been honest with this whole thing throughout. The, when I said I'd go public with my life and be honest and see if it was, in my mind at 17 years old, I was flying over to England believing that I was the best jockey in the world in my in, inside my head. And people might look at that and go, oh, that's crazy and that's insane. And yes, it is, but that's what made me a good jockey mm. because I believed in myself because I studied the best riders in the world. And I was looking at myself at 16 and 17 and I was looking at their careers when they were 16 and 17. And I was thinking to myself, you know, man, what's stopping me from going on and having this, the, the, the same, you know, the same career? And, and I loved it and I was obsessed. I remember on Saturdays, I would rewind Ruby Walsh riding 150 times in 10 minutes. And I'd watch every movie, mate. I'd watch how he approached the fences. I'd watched uh, pivotal points in the races, you know, whether he sit kicked. And I remember like that, I used to be addicted to watching them. And, and that's how I was at that age. Uh, I was too, uh, you know, I was, I was actually in it. And in my head, it's genuine, in my head, I believed, no doubt in my mind, I was as good as any jockey. And that was my mindset throughout my, uh, my career as a young lad. Mm, it seems it's um, like listening to you talking about it now and, and listening to you in the documentary where you're talking about it, like it fueled that sense of competition. Like you were looking at those around you and you were kind of thinking that, yeah, this is all great. This is, all, you know, it's a bit of camaraderie, but you were fully in your head that you were going to beat these. Oh, man, every time yeah, I was always like, don't ever mistake nothing. <laughs> I went there to ride winners. Yeah. I went there to, to make sure them boys knew, no one knew me when I got there. I was making sure that, you know, in my head, it's weird. Like I look back at my life now, that young, mm. you know, arrogant, horrible, young lad that probably not many people liked but at the same time you know people used to always call me mad and mad you know if you mistake passion for madness that's your own <laughs> you know that's up to you i was over passionate who just believed in myself so much that in the end it was my downfall believe it or not yeah but because uh, i'd no rain on me and and i was just let run with it and and yeah just when you have too much passion in something, uh, you're vulnerable. Were you living on your own? Were you living around the yard? Uh, I would you... stay, yeah, on, on accommodations around yards or close by to the yards. Yeah. yeah, it could be heading over from here, I guess, a kind of a lonely experience as well. Do you know what? I'm not going to say it was lonely because <laughs> it, it wasn't until things started to fall apart for me. I, I really enjoyed England. I met some great people. Trainers helped me. 
along the way, everybody backed me from the minute I got there. The first trainer I was with, she backed me, she supported me. You know, things went, we went a bit sour, we had separated. I went on to Patrick Haslam, Paul Nichols, and then uh, Peter Bowen. And every one of them trainers treated me well. Like, there were, you know what I mean? There, there was, you know, it's, I don't think loneliness was a factor because I was so caught up on that, that it was just, do you know what it was? Every day you open the paper and it's just like, I want my writing, what am I writing yeah. the next day? And you become caught up that you don't even notice the time. There's goes. a treadmill, I guess, effect to it again. In that it's day in, day out, different course, different horses, on and on and on, repeat, 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 that kind of thing. That's it, and that's every jockey's dream to get riding regularly. Like that's what the dream is. If you ride regularly, your chances will come, and hopefully, then you can strike with a winner. Yeah. And and I know a lot of people in racing, and you know, young lads come into racing, and it's tough at, at the beginning. And and it's you know you can lose faith, but never give in. Just keep tip showing up and keep keep doing it. Like mm. I, for me, it was a lot different. When I landed over there, I was straight into first jockey job after. The minute I got my license, I rode a few winners. Next thing, I had to pick at the horses, and so I was very busy. So th therefore, that left me to, to not think about nothing else. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I was backed very early. But like I said, it all happened way too too quick for me. Looking back now, mm. uh, we kind of see that footage in, in in the documentary of you after falling at the last at Haydock and like losing it. Like there's the yeah there's a very well aimed punch at the at the fence uh, <laughs> at the side of the course, but like that showed the level of passion that you have for that you thought you had this race won. You thought it was in the pocket, and you describe those last fifty meters of a race whereby it's an out of body experience and that there's no feeling like it that you know you're gonna ride a winner. And just as you're cresting that final hurdle, you must be thinking in your head, I have this here, and you kind of see that fine dividing line of that out of body experience, that passion, that feeling of winning to what it is to not win when you're in that position. Yeah, well, see, the, the reason it was, it was like, the, I knew I was going to win that race five days before that race, and that's, and that's why it killed me so hard. Like, I remember ringing my agent, Dave Roberts, that week, and I said, Dave, I have a feeling that next week is going to be a massive week for me. I said, the horses were just working well. And, you know, horse, just, we, did a, we did a few pieces of work with horses. And I sat on a couple of horses and I just noticed, I said, these have come on. These have stepped up a lot. And we, we had a lot of entries. And I, and I thought to myself, I said, this is going to be a big week and it's going to kick off Saturday. So in my head, I'm going to win this big race. This was a very, very valuable race. I think it's a £150,000 race or whatever it was at the time. It was a very valuable race. And in my head, like, all week I was going to win it. And I know he was 20 to 1 and all this, but I genuinely thought I'm going to win this race. So that is the come down of, of that all week. But we were right in the way that it was going to be the start of a great week because lit that happened, it was a disaster. I struggled to handle it. You know, I was heartbroken at the back of that. When that horse fell, I, I was genuinely heartbroken. Mm. And and that is the, the, the passion I had for the game. It just, when things like that went wrong, like, I know people think it might be a bit extreme. It's like someone stuck a dagger in me. And I did, that was the, the internal the internal emotion, you know what I mean? Was there any thought at that time that, that such a big, an extreme feeling isn't normal? I, I just genuinely, that's what made me the jockey I was when I was yeah. a kid. I just, that obsession with it, you know? But we got over that, that fall and the, the week after was the high again, loads of winners and... <laughs> You know, the, the game plays with you. It's just, uh, when you're a kid, it's hard to, to handle that, that seesaw. I know tomorrow I'll handle it. Yeah. That, I know the next day I'll handle it. But back then, I couldn't handle this seesaw of, of emotions. Like, I genuinely was, was fa I, I had so much passion. And even to this day, the passion is still there. But over a lifetime experience now of the la now I'm going to know how to handle it. Mm. Did you have any people to talk about it with the around then? Oh, did you have any friends? My in, in problem the is when, when I was a kid, I was probably an arrogant man who thought he was Batman. You know what I mean? And and I, in you know maybe I wouldn't was afraid to reach out to anyone because when things went wrong for me in England, I was in a bad place mentally. I remember leaving the race courses and I was very lonely. I was very afraid. I remember one day like and I said this. Before I remember coming out of Sandown Race Course, like, and I, and I was genuine, like, genuinely very, very lonely and very afraid, and, and and I had a lot of bad thoughts in my mind, and 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 I remember, 
at that period of time, if I only had the, who, how can you turn, at, I think I was 20 then, how can I go and tell someone I'm feeling like that? At that age, I couldn't, because no one showed me it was okay to do it. Mm. You know, as in, where now a lot more people are speaking out about their internal problems of mental health and, and things like that, where, you know, to be honest, this is why I did the documentary, and, and this is why, like, I turned my life around. I'm still rebuilding. I have a lot of things to sort out yet in my life. But I wanted to show someone that it is possible, and it's okay if you're feeling that way that you got to tell someone. Because if I had been got, like, and this is no, I'm not giving out to anyone in restaurant. I walked away because I had problem, my own problems I couldn't deal with. But it may be looking back now, maybe if, if I had professional help, like... People say, oh, Paddy Morgan just walked away from a career because he didn't give an F about it. He didn't, he just... Do you think a, a lad about to be champion conditional jockey after riding ten winners the nine days before would just retire and walk away if there wasn't something wrong with him? I'm watching the documentary, reading your story, I get the sense that you walked away because you cared too much about it. Absolutely. I was too passionate and I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. It nearly... I... I described this before, and I know, like, Peter Bowen, who I love, and his family, his wife, Karen, that took me in down there, and his sons, they all treated me like one of their own. Mm. And I have nothing but respect for them, and they gave me a massive opportunities on good horses. In the end, I gave a horse a bad ride, and I lost a ride on the horse. And, uh, you know, it's not their fault. It was my fault. And, and I want to make that clear, that I have absolutely nothing but respect for the Bowen family and everything they've done for me. And... Uh, yeah, it was just I couldn't handle a, a turn of events that, that that led me to have to walk away because I was way too passionate and I was in love with the horse. Like uh, Sue Fleur, was Sue the Fleur horse. Yeah, yeah, I was in love with Sue Fleur, and I know like people looking in from the outside, man, but I love that horse. There's a, there's a line in it, like if, if you want to talk about passion, there's a line in the documentary whereby you're looking straight to camera, and I don't think you break gaze once where you say. If you were handed a gun yeah. and Sue Fleur and your mother were in the room. You would have no hesitation if you were told you had to shoot one that your mother's yeah. gone bye bye. God, my mother, I love her to bits, but what, what's her, what was her reaction to that? Did she she, she laughed. She laughed. <laughs> she says, "I know his passion. I'm pretty sure I'm safe." Grant, okay, <laughs> but like that's that's the level that you were operating yeah, on. There's no doubt about it. When I was 18, I wouldn't have liked to have the two of them up against the wall or 19. Like that. It was a dream in, like, do you know what? The guy on the documentary, uh, sorry now, forgive me, the, the, the racing journalist on the documentary summed it up so good. Dara O'Crohor. Da Dara. Yeah. Dara summed it up so good. I thought he was phenomenal. He, he, you know, looking back, he just said, look, Paddy could only see things turning out one way. Yeah. And then when that was changed, it was gone. And, and that is right. Like, I did think Sue Fleur was going to take me to the next level. Like, Sue Fleur is the most talented horse I've ever rode. And I've sit on a lot of Grand National winners or Grade 1 winners. I've ridden them, man. I've sit on all these good horses at home, uh, multiple Grade 1 horses. But Sue Fleur, if he didn't get injured, Sue Fleur was unlucky. He got injured as a four. Sue Fleur as a four-year-old was a Grade 1 winner by six lengths. Now, I wasn't lucky enough to get to ride him that day, but... but uh, he was he was potentially one of the best horses. He just was unlucky that the things things went wrong. You know, he ran to a mark of one fifty four as a four year old. Oh. You know, and he was a, a very very good horse. And I was just that horse. You know, I loved him. Yeah. <laughs> I loved him to bits. Was the separation from him? Was that the trigger for everything? I think. Yeah. Well, from the, from the the problem what was with that. I'm glad actually we can touch on this a bit. Was mm. in my mindset every day was be the best jockey in your head. It was just channeled, be the best jockey, you know, have a great career, just racing, racing, racing. And this might sound uh, like crazy to people, but the minute I got the phone call that I wasn't riding, I have never wanted to be a jockey again until a year ago. That moment. From that moment, from always wanting to be one of the best jockeys ever. And in my mind, that was it. Like, I used to look at McCoy and admire everything he had, the strength, the power, you know, the, the, just everything, and, and look at all these other jockeys, and, you know, I, I envied them all because I was like, oh, I'd love to have that career, you know? Like, Tony McCoy, I'd love to have his mental strength. I'd love to have the dedication that man had. I didn't have any of, you know, all these top riders had a, a brilliant uh, a mental strength, yeah. where when I was young, I hadn't got that. You know what I mean? And, and I admired them all for that, but I envied them at the same time. I would have loved them to be able to deal with a career, you know, deal with... Uh, racing the way them boys did. If that phone call had to come along and you were told by Dave Roberts that you weren't going to have the ride on Sue Fleury going forward, if that had to happen you're 25, 26? Probably could have handled it, no yeah. doubt. 
Life, life, you teach it. Yeah. But when you're a kid, everything is there. The things that matter to me when I was 20... Everything's like, amplified. Like, when yeah. I'm running around trying to impress girls all day and running around uh, messing with my friends and you think trying to be cool with all your friends, then you look back 10 years and you're like, man, none of that shit even matters anymore. Yeah. You know, what, what do you do? And, you know, we're always having to go to... It's just life changes you. The things you, you realise, you know, over 10 years, I look back now and go, man, once you're alive and breathing and you wake up every day, go to work, do your thing, whether that's horse racing or whatever it is you do or whatever industry you work in. Be as successful as you can, but Lord, don't let it define you. You know, sports, sports defined me. When I was a kid, I judged my own personal opinion on how I did at, at racing. And when I lost racing, then I pretty much became... Uh, couldn't live in, I couldn't fit into the real world. Like all my childhood, I was channeled to be the best jockey in the world, in my head. Like I came from a flapping industry where I was so successful through my teens, you know, like 12, 13, 14, 15, that all I knew was horse racing, and horse racing, and horse, be the best jockey, be the best jockey. And this is in my mind. So then when you have that, and then all that's took away, and then you just throw me at 21 years of age into the real world, to go now and try and uh, live a normal life, man, it got insane after that. Then that's when I just was like, all right, you know, fuck racing, excuse my language. Okay. It's like, I just, I couldn't live a normal life. I would go and try and do things. I had all these dreams in my head, and this is one for the youth actually as well, for the youth nation. I had all these things in my head, but I could never go after them because the guilt of walking away from the career would always creep in, whether that was six months from now, a year from now, six weeks from today, five days. I could be doing brilliant in anything and then I'd be like, oh, I'm done again, out of here. And I would go partying all the time and, you know, fall down the wrong, the, the wrong habits. Yeah. You basically try and fill that hole with other stuff. I chased a high that didn't exist. I, like I said the last time, I genuinely searched for something that couldn't be got outside of racing, like, the, the highs racing gave me, oh my God, I felt like I was the best kid in the world when I won a race, and I really enjoyed it. And, uh, oh, it was just, I don't know what it was. It gave me a self of, what's the word, self-worth yeah. winning races. And and then when I lost all that, I was just like a, a, a what's the word, a, you know, a, a wild, you know, headless chicken running around in the real world, chasing this high that couldn't be got. It, cause to, to go through the list of, of stuff that you basically tried to replace that with, there's like, there's drink, drugs and women. And there's two things within that for sure. When you talk about, like, you're a cocaine user. Yeah. Like, that's a very short term, I'm up here, oh, and then suddenly okay. you're, you're back yeah. down to nothing. And the chasing women thing as well is, I guess for want of a better way of looking at this, there is a sense of trying to chase a winner with that too. Oh, 100%. Like, when I came away from racing, it was first about girls. It was just girls crazy. You know when you're young and you're enthusiastic and it was just all about the girls. It was like meet girls and your brain just... It was like overflow. It was like the, gone from the racing and then my brain went over. I remember, like, you know, I'm not proud of this. There was times where I was texting 30 or 40 girls at one time. I had this old Nokia 6210 back then. There was none of these, <laughs> you know, fancy iPhones. It's grand, some politicians still have them. <laughs> and, and, and I genuinely, I'm not joking, there was that many numbers in that phone because I was in a period of my life where I was just lost and I was just constantly chasing a high. And, you know, no disrespect to all the lovely girls I met in my life and, and, and things, it was like, I was just chasing this high. And, and that's what it was. And, and I look back now and I remember, like, it was just... Yeah, it was just constantly texting. It was just, my mind was just girls, 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 and that was it. You've got a mind that's really alive. Like, con like constantly, even now, like, you kind of, does, it's, you need to be, it needs to be engaged, I think, 100% of the time, and that would have been one way of doing it. And the drinking drugs, I guess, is one way of almost, the, the drink would definitely take the edge off that and turn that off and dim it yeah. a little bit. And the drugs would probably, I guess, have the opposite effect and send you haywire. Well, I started taking drugs as fun, like, at this stage, I was like, all right, fuck racing, I'm done with it, it's over. And I had the, the mindset then that, do you know what, I don't care about it anymore. So then what happened was I would go and I would take drugs and party, recreate, you know, like, just party with cocaine and enjoy it, and it became fun. But then what happened was, over time, it became less about the girls, less about the drink, and more about just taking cocaine. And I genuinely have 
and uh, I've took cocaine every day for a long time through in phases of the last 10 years like I could go six or seven months on the party session taking drugs and then I could go and work for a good while and I'd do things right like you know the man I used to work for all the time uh, I would go to work do great things for a few months you see me there every day loving it and next thing I'm gone and when I'm gone I'm gone you wouldn't see me for months I'd be taking cocaine every day and as I said before I, 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 I took that much cocaine I often puked blood onto the street you know and I'm saying this to you know the reason I've come so clean and open about it is because you know culture in the country it, it, like unless you live with your head up your arse uh, culture in this country is social life you know and I'm staying in my lane here recreational drugs mm. you know I'm not going to talk about anything I know nothing about you know my, staying like as I say stay in your lane and, and what I used to do was I used to take cocaine so the, the culture in this country you know it's fun to do it and it's fun to do it and every, you know not everybody but most most people in Ireland will indulge in it or in any country but as long as you know when to say oh whoa 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 get that away from me it's not what it's meant to be because the reality is is the youth of the nation will be they have be faced with them choices to go into that life and unfortunately for me it grabbed me and then I depended on it mm. where where other people you know can go in and out of it and never affects their life and and uh, you know who am I to give out to them I'm talking to the poor lad that you know, gets caught up in it like I do. And and no one's a bad person with, with, you know, with drugs. It's just, it's so prevalent in societies now that, you know, once I got into it, unfortunately, I couldn't get out of it. And uh, yeah, I'm just reaching out to the, the, the same guy. You know, no one's a bad person, man. Mm. We grew up in this culture. We didn't invent it. We didn't invent cocaine, you know. At the same time, you realised you had a problem. And you, oh, and you, and you did, re, you did you reached out to your doctor and your doctor was like, well, you obviously clearly have a depressive streak to you. But you decided not to initially take the antidepressants yeah. that she would have prescribed for you. Was there a reason for that? Was there a reason why you... Because I think you mentioned that you were scared of them. Yeah. Well, a good friend of mine, I confided in first that I was suicidal and I was going to shoot myself. And he, him and his wife and my family, had that, I had a chat and they took me... I went to the doctors. And what had happened was I went to my doctor and I just went in the door and, as you can imagine, I just opened the floodgates. I let it rip. I said... Um, I said, I'm con very, very suicidal. And I told her if I'd have got a gun the other night, I would have blew Like, I would have been dead. It's as simple as that. There's t no two ways about it. I was in that much pain that I was just ashamed of myself. I felt like I'd nothing. I'd lost everything. Mm. I had no way back, you know. Like, people used to say to me, would you ever go back racing? And through this period of my life, I was like, never. Wouldn't be able. Too heavy, too fat. Never lose the weight. Never. It's over. Forget it. But then I would go home and a day from then or a week from then, it would set in, oh, you're a waste of talent. Like someone might say to me, oh, you're the biggest waste of talent. So then you have, you have this. So I nearly cracked. Like I said, there was a, uh, at that time I said, I need, uh, my friend said, I need to take you to the doctor. So once I went into the doctor and I sat down with her and I just, like I said, rip, let the floodgates go and I told her, uh, you know, I was considering shooting myself and she said, look, I'm going to send you down to Roscommon to see such a doctor down there. So I went in and this is one of these institutions where people go to. And I remember walking in and I remember my friend looking at me and, man, that is a scary place, man. You know, I knew the minute I walked in there that that was not the place for me. Mm. As bad as I had it the last few days, I knew, like, you know, no disrespect to anyone that ends up in there and, and things, but... You know, I went in, I met the doctor, he asked me question after question. It was just, kept talking, talking, and he would just ask question, and I was just there answering, answering. And at the end of it, he said, look, this is not the place for you. He said, so I think I'm going to prescribe you some tablets or that, whatever. He gave me the prescription of it. And I wasn't sure about it, but I knew he was right in one thing, that that wasn't the place for me, because I realised that. Because my friend looked at me and he says, we're not leaving you here. Mm. So I go back to my GP. I, I can't remember if it was that evening or the next day, and I just said, I have a quick question for you. I said, them tablets. I said, I just want your honest opinion. I said, do you think I should uh, take them or, or, or need them? Or, and she was advising me, you know, medically, after my situation, and, and don't get me wrong, people do need medical help, and people do need tablets. 
they frightened me. Like it did. It, I never. I didn't want to end up on antidepressant tablets. That's me now. I'm not talking about for what anyone else. This was just my personal yeah. thing, and I'm sure they've helped many people. But for me, it was like I do not want to end up on antidepressant tablets. So I went. I went home and I kicked them in the bin. That help you? Did you feel like you were? Oh uh, yeah, I was good then for another 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 while. Then I kind of got a new lease of life, and uh, you know I would go in and out of these phases. Yeah. You know. How long were the phases last? Oh, months at a time. And good and bad. M months. Yeah, I'd work for a while, very good, great, wouldn't drink for a while. But see, my problem was I have, I have an all-in personality. Yeah. You know what I mean? And do not get me wrong, like nobody is perfect. And uh, I am on a journey, but if you think it's not a battle for me going forward here for the rest of my life, of course it is. I had a personality where it's all or nothing. And I, when I would go into the, set, the partying, I would go all in for months at a time, and then I would come away from it. And then I would work again, put the head down. And you know, I had kids too at two different stages of my life where things weren't, too, you know, things were grand. I was, you know, living a quiet life, not drinking much at all and trying to get on. I tried to go back into racing. If, a few times and it didn't work out for me because I just, I was, you know, I just couldn't. My head wasn't, it was never in it. And then further down the line, further down the line, uh, you know, I, I had a second child then as well. And yeah, I just couldn't become a, great, a dad or nothing like that. So look, these are things I have to fix moving forward. And as soon as I get my head right and my stability, I'll be working on and doing the best I can for them as well. Yeah, the kid thing is, um, it's a difficult one to manage because you want, to do the best by them and make sure that they grow the best person they can be. But I guess where you were at that time, you're also walking a fine line whereby they don't need someone like me in their life kind of thing. Well, it wasn't even that. It was just I chose drugs and I, ch I couldn't fit into normal life. I couldn't live a normal life. I couldn't become a dad. I was the worst dad in the world. Like, and I trust Was me, that you thinking that or was No, it, no, was this is, I was and I still am. I have a lot to fix and I, I'm just working on stability in my life and, and, and once I get, you know, I'm going to put things the, as best I can over the next few months. Mm. Like, it's something I've struggled with. I've, I've struggled with, I struggled with normal life. I couldn't fit into everyday normal life because I was too prone to, falling into like the worst depressions and I know people you know looking out think oh that lad's too confident he didn't suffer from depression I can assure you I'm the most confident man you ever met and I it would get me to my knees it would I would as I, I said this before I would walk down that street and I would stop Beyonce on the street if, if you know and, and that is no joke if she was coming towards me if I wanted to talk to her same with a businessman I would have a chat with him I had that confidence it left me, I always got so down that it left me that I wouldn't sit at the dinner table and say hello to my mother. I would, I would go up to bed and when they were all in, in bed at night, I'd get up and eat food. That's what it left me. It left me I can't, couldn't sit at the table with my own family and have a dinner because I felt that worthless. And, and, and that's what it did to me. And, and then what I would do to mask that depression was I would do these drug fuel benders and I would just drive it to the moon. I would go on these parties, like just sleeping with random women and taking drugs. Like, you know, I choose that life to, to, to because my, I wasn't right on the inside. I had, to, I had to mask my problems with something. Like the reality is, is I suff suffered from a severe depression for many, many a times in my, in my life. It's came in and out. I've come in and out of them phases where, you know, in my life three times I was suicidal as heck. That moment where, that you speak about, about being, going from essentially from, from bridge to bridge along the train tracks and it being a, a, an all or nothing moment for you. Like, even, even the footage of, of, um, of watching you standing on the tracks and staring down the bridge, like that for me is a, is, is a hugely powerful visual in and of itself. I can't even imagine what it was like for you to go and try and revisit something like that and even to try and talk about it now. When, when you know, I, I'll tell you, this is no joke. When, when, we, when we filmed that, the, the, when I done that piece in the documentary about that day, because that day is so fresh in my mind. It, I can remember that day, like, so clearly. It took, and this is no joke, it took me three weeks to get over that scene. Like, when I was just talking, that I relived that in my mind and I, I wasn't right after that film and that for three weeks. I, I, Anthony will tell you that. Mm. I was emotionally drained. I was empty. I was tired. When I was doing that documentary, I made up my mind that I was going to give everything as it was and, and, and I was going to say it as it was 
and and whoever judges it, at least I can't be got. I'm honest, yeah. and I can assure you that is emotional turmoil for me when 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 I film that. I relived that day in my mind so clearly that I I nearly went into it that I was nearly back there, and and I remember it so well. I I walked down to the train tracks, and I climbed up the bridge, and then I walk. It's about a couple of hundred yards or meters, whatever, and I walk down to the other bridge. And I, I remember I'm walking around in circles and I have convinced myself at this stage that I am going to take my own life. I, I, and it's a scary feeling. I'm walking around in circles and I don't know whether I'm walking around in circles for five minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, but I'm just walking around in circles and I was just like, you, I was killing myself. And I remember that, I'm just walking around, walking around, and then next thing, I got this feeling inside me. It was like, if you don't get out of here, you are dead. And, and I had to then... Like, it was literally like, a, it was a realisation of what was about to happen, that I was gone. Mm. And, and that is the reality. I was one foot away from, from being wiped off the earth. I was going to step in front of a train. And, and, and that's an awful thing to say. Well, you know, my family done everything for me. Friends of mine have done everything for me. But the reality is, was I suffered with a, a severe regret of walking away from a, a great career that, that led me to, into these dark places throughout my life when I would face my own reality, which my own reality was, was, a, was the biggest waste of natural talent uh, ever in my mind, you know. That decision to, to not go through with it, um, how quickly does the decision to get back on track and, that and try evening. and work with it, was that instantaneous? That evening, because I was going to be dead tomorrow if I didn't. Jeez. It was as I rang Anthony and I said to Anthony, I says, uh, if I'm not dead today, I'll be dead tomorrow. And I, I asked him, I said, look, I said, I, I need to get back racing. It's the only thing. I knew that this was the only discipline, right? I've made every mistake a man can make in his life. I've done all good things in my life, and I messed every one of them up. Couldn't become a dad. Couldn't do anything for longer than a period of time because I just, I made every mistake could be made. And it was all boiled down to, you know, I've been all over the world and don't get me wrong, I could have went into and done a lot of things. But I, uh, six months down the line, the same thing would reoccur. If I made money doing something else, I would just blow it all anyway. So I thought to myself, it was like, the only way you're fixing this and the only way you're staying alive is if you go back racing, and it, it was it was a it was do or die, and that and you know that is my reality. I could never forgive myself for walking away from my racing career, and the only way I could fix my mental health was to go the whole way back. So I we I rang Anthony that night, and I said, I said this, you know, I need to get back. You know, I told him if I wasn't dead today, I'm going to be dead tomorrow, and and I said I need to get back, and he just said no problem. He tell not like he 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 kind of Anthony embraced it mm. he wanted to, he wanted to do this for me and it's a funny story that we couldn't fit in the documentary years ago Anthony had, we, we were sitting in Poland and we were actually after partying and we were sitting at the train station at like six o'clock in the morning I was full as a lord from vodka and I was after sleeping with all these Polish girls and whatever. And you know, I used to get, when I'd be drunk and hungover, I used to get sentimental when i talk about my racing career. And me and Anthony were waiting on a train and we were chatting about my racing career. And anyone will tell you, any time I got drunk, I used to always go back into talk. To, and I was telling them about how I would love to go back, but I just hadn't the mental strength or never be able. And, and, and we were just at a bad place. And, like, and I remember Anthony saying, if I ever want to go back, this was six years before, if I ever want to go back, he said, I'll train you to go back. So it came full circle. Absolutely. Uh, it's a remarkable thing to, to see you come back. When you're deciding you want to come back, did you want to come back to the same, like, is the ultimate goal to be at the same level that you left off or that you were heading towards when you were uh, with Sue Fleur? Or was it a case of you want to go back to go back to prove it to yourself? Oh, I have a point to prove to myself. Yeah. I want to go back to build stability. I want to use racing as a springboard for me to have a better life, a more stable future. I need to get my shit together, become a better family man, fix things with my kids, you know, as soon as possible. Or uh, You know, I just, I just want to become a better man. And I just, like, I have so many wrongs I need to right. Mm. But it's going to take, you can't write 10 years of wrong overnight. So it's going to take me time, but like moving forward, I just want to uh, get on. I want to wake up every day, enjoy what I'm doing. I love my job. I want to hopefully come back now, ride some nice winners over the next 10 years. Hopefully uh, I can ride for another 10 years. Touch wood, I don't get smashed to pieces. Um, but, 
yeah, hopefully if I could, over the next 10 years, have a career uh, with a bit of luck, get on some nice horses. Uh, I know the work I have ahead of me, the hard work, but this is what's training me to be able to live a normal life again. This, the, the discipline I need for me to be a jockey after the lifestyle I'm after living is, 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 this is teaching me what I need in life. So look, if I can come back, have a good career, hopefully take down a few good races over the next 10 years and, and use, it, use it as a springboard to go on and have a better life. You know, when I finish racing in 10 years time and, and, and be, try and fix all the, the wrongs I, I need to fix. The upshot of all this is that you're gonna help others who may have been down the same path, who may be down there now, who may be there in the future. Like you're blogging all this, you're putting it out there to the world, you're being as open and honest as you possibly can be. You've no idea how much that's going to help people. Like I don't think, even the, the feedback you probably had already, which has probably been huge, Yeah. I don't think you've any idea the amount of people that you're going to help just being as open and as honest as you're being now. Well, I had this thing from the beginning. From the beginning was, and I had said it to my mother, I said, I'm the only way I can maybe pull this off to fix my own life is if I went public and had accountability. And and I thought it will help someone and it will help me. And I so I came on the video like sixteen stone, a drunk, fresh off a bottle of whiskey, telling everyone I'm coming back racing and I'm gonna lose five and a half stone. And I thought I would show people the way I was like, Do you know what? I'm not gonna come on a camera two years from now and show you a, a man who's turned his life around. I'm gonna show you a man that's worse off than you are. I'm going to tell you how messed up my life is, all the mistakes I made, but I'm going to show you me come from, the, from near death right back into a professional sport today. And, and, and I showed them the whole journey on that blog. And I can assure you I am worse off than any one of them today. Uh, uh, as in, you know, people look at me, I'm not a successful man. I'm a man that's become distant from his kids, distant from family members, blew everything I ever did financially. And I'm going to show you a man come from nothing to rebuild into hopefully what will be a, a good career and, and then after racing go on and, and do good things in life and maybe even I might go into motivational speaking because, you know, with my blog, like every day or two on Snapchat, I post stupid little videos on that blog, but in them stupid little videos of me messing around, there's one clip that might just save your life. Paddy, I wish you the best with everything. Thanks so much for coming in and, and telling your story for the for the documentary and recounting it all here with us as well. It's um it's a, it's an incredible journey. May you kind of prosper with the kids, especially going forward and everything else that goes along with that. But continued success to you. Yeah, thanks a million. Like I said, uh, yeah, check out the blog, Mad Murrigan, and uh, yeah, I got a lot of things I need to fix in my life. Hopefully, over the next few months, I can do it. And uh, yeah, check out the blog. The time for cotton is over. Paddy, thanks cheers. a million. <laughs>